Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, at uh, this new session on uh, Mozambique insurgency in a former donor dominant country. Uh, I am joined today by Salvador Forquilla, who is a senior researcher and director at the IES Instituto, the Institute for Social and Economic Studies in Maputo. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of Bordeaux. Uh, and his research focuses on governance, strengthening civic uh, participation, conflict and political violence. And he's currently researching the extent of youth radicalization in the Northern provinces of Mozambique. He is actually today, uh, today joining us from Lishinga in the province of Niassa. Uh, Paulo Israel, uh, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Western Cape, uh, he has carried out extensive research in Northern Mozambique, specifically in Cap Delgado, focusing on the intersections between popular culture and politics. His doctoral thesis focuses on the history of Ma the Maconde Mapico masquerades. Paolo has also worked on witch hunts and occult rum rumors, storytelling and oral performance. His broader research interests include the historiography of Mozambique, African popular culture, the theory of history, and the anthropology of belief. We are also joined by Anna Bang, who is a historian and professor at UIB. She is a researcher of Islamic history in the, of the Western Indian Ocean in the 19th and 20th centuries, including Yemen, Oman, Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique. Her work focuses on various forms of religious change, but also social, legal, and political change. Um, Joan Feijó, uh, who has not yet joined us, uh, but uh, hopefully he will join us soon, is a sociologist with a PhD in African studies. He is the coordinator of Observatório do Meio Rural, OMR, which is a uh, research uh, institution in Mozambique um, for rural development. And he researches, he coordinates the research line about poverty, inequalities and conflicts. Um, and is also the scientific uh, coordinator of the scientific council. He has researched and published on identities, labor relations, migration, and now he is very keen and he, he has just published on the internally displaced people from uh, the, this conflict. Antonio De Lauri from CMI, He's a social and cultural anthropologist. Um, he, he is a research professor at CMI. He's a founding editor in chief of the journal Public Anthropologist and the director of the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. Liv Tennyson is a research director at CMI. She's a political scientist researching women, politics and Islam in the Middle East and Northern Africa with specialization of, uh, on Sudan. Uh, welcome everyone um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, we are continuing this session from last week where we discussed the political economy of the country, the role of donors in uh, preventing and mitigating the conflict, predicting and mitigating the conflict the context of violence in Mozambique, not just this, but the, uh, violence, and then uh, insurgency and global warfare and where does Mozambique uh, stand. I will invite now Salvador to share a little bit about uh, the results of your findings that you have been conducting ever since 2017 when uh, the, this conflict first uh, broke out. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, my presentation is on insurgency dynamics in Northern Mozambique. What I'm going to do this morning is to share with you some preliminary uh, findings of uh, uh, research uh, which is part of our research program on state uh, uh, violence and development challenges about in Mozambique, uh, which started at Yeze in 20, the funding of the Norwegian embassy in Maputo, which I'd like to say many thanks. 
So um, I will focus on three main elements. Uh, first of all, uh, briefly on research questions, and then I'll move to methodology. And uh, finally, uh, some preliminary findings, uh, looking at development of the insurgency, recruitment dynamics, and then cross-border dynamics. So in terms of research questions, uh, we, uh, we took these uh, two research questions from our research program. First, what factors favor incentivize the development of the insurgency in Cabo Delgado? And then why is the insurgency becoming strong? Uh, uh, with the methodology, uh, we did field visit, um, actually in, in a field visit, still in field visit in, in Yasa. So I've been to Cabo Delgado two weeks ago and then Ampula, and now I'm in Nyasa. In September, October, I've been to Cabo Delgado, Nampula, and Nyasa as well in July also. Um, uh, so we visited uh, different locations. Uh, we went uh, uh, to the border with Tanzania and we, we even managed the border uh, to see what is going on um, on the other side of the border, I mean, Tanzanian uh, side. And then we did several interviews with just leaders, Muslim, uh, especially local authorities at district and provincial level, defense and security forces, but also youth. Um, now, briefly, with regard to the preliminary findings, uh, uh, Nyasa and Nampula have been hosting radical cells, at least in, in different locations in Lishinga, Mekula, Marupa, and Nyasa, but also in, in Nampula city and member. Um, in Nampula, apart from Cabo Delgado, of course. Um, this have been closed by Mozambican authorities following the incident li linked to radicalization. Some locations are considered as recruitment hotspots hot to feed the students in Cabo Delgado, for example, in Mekula, Marupa, Iniasa, uh, and Mosuril, Nakala Vella, Nakala Porto, and member in Nampula. Uh, there was even an attack carried out by insurgents in Mekula, Iniasa on 12. February 2020. Uh, so uh, in terms of the development of the insurgency, the, the question is why is the, the insurgency becoming stronger? Um, the insurgency in Cabo Delgado was uh, able to develop thanks to a number of factors, including, so I, I have here several factors. I, I would like just to mention some of them. Uh, first of all, your economic condition favorable to the membership membership of young people in the insurgents group, uh, social, political, and economic. We have also regional organized crime networks from Tanzania, Kenya, DRC, Somalia, with trafficking of all kinds uh, and involvement money laundering by criminal groups to finance microcredit schemes targeting lo local, uh, uh, local youth. Fragility at the borders, um, which has resulted in a migratory movement for illegal mining, poaching, and fishing, the arrival of migrants with military and organized crime experience, the arrival of migrants who had been in contact with Salafist ideas in Tanzania and Kenya, preaching uh, radical Islam. Uh, it's also important to mention the arrival of the Islam Islamic uh, 19, with more experienced fight fighters, more sophisticated weaponry, international visibility, and improved propaganda mechanisms, the action of violence against local populations with the aim of exacerbating a feeling of abandonment by the government. Um, lack of coordination among different units of defense and security forces. Uh, we are talking about police, the army, and the intelligence services. And lack of motivation on the the element defense and security forces, there is a feeling uh, when talking about, uh, with the uh, military, for example, there is a feeling that this does not belong to us. It benefits the Frelim based in Maputo. Uh, also low uh, monthly pay, a simple soldier earns around uh, 3,000 remiti cash, uh, which is equivalent of uh, uh, 55 US dollars per month. Uh, we have also generalized the defense and security forces. Internal divisions, conflicts within Frelimo at the highest level, which do not allow a common vision and the design and implementation of a coherent strategy on the ground. Uh, also inappropriate uh, response from the state to the conflict with mass detentions and the closing of mosques in the affected areas, especially at the beginning of the armed violence. 
So now, what about the recruitment dynamics? So the recruitment process has two main dimensions. Uh, we have external dimension and internal dimension. The external dimension refers to the incorporation of from a vast network based on conflict regions such as East uh, DRC, Somalia, and most probably Middle East, North Africa. Uh, and our interviewees, for example, they mentioned the presence of white fighters among the insurgents in Cabo Delgado, especially Mosimba the Praia, um, the last, let's say, last battle for Mosimba the Praia. And for sure, this has to do with the arrival of ISIS, particularly from June 2019 onward. And foreign fighters come with the experience of war as they have been exposed to jihad for many, many years. Um, with regard to the internal dimension, uh, it has similar dynamics to what happens in East Africa with Al-Shabaab, Al 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 for example, or West Africa with Boko Haram in terms of where and how and takes place and the main target groups. So there are uh, many similarities actually. So jihadists, jihadists in Mo Northern Mozambique, they invest mostly in local mosques, madrasa, groups of friends and informal markets through microcredit schemes oriented to young people in order for them to start a small business. In general, the recruitment happens via religious penetration, art art artisanal mining, fishing, informal business, job promise, social networks and scholarships to study in Tanzania. So many young people um, uh, received promise to go to Tanzania for religious studies. But there's also uh, uh, what I would call forced recruitment through kidnappings during the attacks to and small towns. The recruitment process uh, targets particularly unemployed young people, especially in those districts at the border with Tanzania in Nyasa and the coastal districts of Nampula. With regard to the cross-border dynamics, most of the leaders of radical cells in Northern Mozambique are Tanzanians or Mozambicans that have received the religious training in Tanzania, especially in Tanga. So uh, many interviews, they mention Tanga as a place where most of the young people go for religious training, but also Songhai, of, of course. There is an intense cross-border movement linked to smuggling, illegal mining, and the insurgency in Cabo Delgado. In some cases, for example, Lupeliche, which is a locality in Kobe, uh, Lago district here in Nyasa, illegal mining camps function as radicalization spaces for young people. And young Mozambicans are intercepted on a regular basis, trying to cross the border to Tanzania for religious trainings. To conclude, uh, I would say that although armed violence is still localized in Cabo Delgado, the scale and the consequences of the violence go beyond Cabo Delgado. Uh, the intensification of the flow of displaced population fleeing, fleeing violence, recruitment patterns, and the establishment of radicalized youth cells in, in other districts of Cabo Delgado, Nampula, and Nyasa make the conflict a phenomenon which concerns the entire northern region of Mozambique. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salvador. That was, uh, well, a bit disturbing, uh, but very informative. Um, I, I wonder if you could just say a couple of words in terms of how the conflict has changed, because it seemed to be something a bit localized in Musimbwe when it started with gr specific grievances, local grievances, and now it has uh, increased in scale. It is a full-blown war, we can say, and as you say, with a very, extended, a very extended arm to the rest of the provinces, the region and beyond. Oh yeah, of course uh, we can see kind of uh, um, the, the conflict evolved itself. Uh, at the very beginning, it was a, uh, a religious group which evolved to uh, um, military movement. And then the attacks at the very beginning were uh, targeting um, um, small villages, but now that's not the case. I mean, we, uh, they are star tar targeting um, uh, small towns, I would say, like Musimbo da Praia, uh, Makumi, uh, uh, 
Uh, and then uh, the impact of the conflict itself is, is, is huge. But then we have also, uh, as, uh, uh, as you might know, um, attacks on Tanzanian side. Uh, in October, we had attack, for example, uh, in the region um, uh, of Mtwara in, in Tanzania. Uh, we conflict actually not only, uh, let's say, Mozambican business. I mean, uh, from the very beginning, we were convinced that this is a conflict which concerned the region the whole, especially uh, uh, East Africa, um, Mozambique, Tanzania, but also probably Kenya, because uh, some of the uh, jihadists come from the uh, uh, So now um, I, I think that Mozambican state has much more difficult to fight the insurgency itself as they um, uh, manage to penetrate in the, I would say the social fabric um, and uh, we have even information coming from the field saying that there are people supporting the insurgency itself, even if it, the violence is extreme, um, but we can actually see in some places uh, supporting the, 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 the insurgency. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, that's why we are saying that it's no longer, I mean, uh, a kind of capital because uh, the dynamics, they the, of the conflict go very, uh, beyond Cap Delgado, uh, and I would even say beyond Zambi. Uh, thank you. I'm sure that there will be some uh, questions and more discussions uh, about this issue. I would like to go now to Paolo. Uh, and uh, you've been uh, living uh, many years uh, in part of the places that have been attacked. And as you have described, the, the village and the house that you lived during your field work were destroyed. Um, some of your friends have to had to flee. Um, how do you see this conflict and what are the issues? Uh, you studied the Maconde as uh, the visible faces of course, Salvador was talking about um, the, the foreigners, but the visible, some of the visible places, some of the videos that we have seen were Mwani youth that were leading the conflict. Um, can you tell us about uh, some of these dynamics between uh, the Mwani, the Makondi, and other uh, groups in, in Cabo Delgado? And um, how, how is it from your end and, and from the people you have been talking to, how is this seen? Okay, thank you. Um, um, yeah, just, I mean, just to say that yeah, the place where I did research was especially Muidumbi, which has been attacked in the, uh, well, first in April, the first attack, and then the, the last one uh, from 31st of October. Uh, up until now, they say that it has been retaken by the FDS, but the evidence on the ground doesn't, doesn't look like it has really been taken. And so there's been a push so that basically the insurgency has, has gotten to the doors of Moeda. Um, uh, they are some 20 kilometers away at the moment. And basically the entire area of the southeastern section of the Maconde Plateau has been uh, um, annihilated. There's nothing left. Everybody has left. There's 40,000 people who have been uh, uh, either walking on foot towards Moeda or walking south towards Pemba. Um, um, and yeah, a sort of whole form of life has been wiped out, as it was the case before with the, with the section, with the sort of area between um, Moeda Mosimba, those, and, 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 and then of course now Mosimba. Look, I had prepared um, a few points to put on the table. I'm aware that I've got only five minutes. Um, and in those five minutes, I've already wasted one. Um, so you have uh, your five minutes. Just so, uh, go ahead. <laughs> so I'm sharing something. I don't know if people can see it. Can yes. See it? All right. Yes. So I just wanted to put first point on the table. I mean, there's been a lot of debate about this insurgency, you know, sort of internal factors, external factors. And I think Salvador has been one of the ones who's been able to merge the two. But I think, you know, at the beginning, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, this poverty, ethnic fault lines, corruption. Uh, this is almost a, a local rebellion. And then another side which said, you know, this is actually ISIS and it comes from outside, etc. And I think it's a bit of a false debate. And I think both, and it's, it's so, in some ways identical to what was being to the debate that that, that people had in the 80s about whether Renamo was, you know, 
um, a local phenomenon and it was a destabilization phenomenon. I think the, the debate was resolved out of the case. And of course it was both. So I think that's just one point to keep in mind that as we discuss this, we must see both sides. Um, then there, there were a couple of things that I wanted to put on the table concerning Cabo Delgado specifically, um, very quick. And the one point is that we, do, we mustn't forget the specific histories of violence of the province. It's a province that I think has seen uh, an extreme amount of recurring violence in the same forms throughout its history. It's maybe got a, a decade of peace in its entire history. Um, this is a little song I recorded once in the field that people were singing, you know, grow up so you can see how people can be dangerous. Um, I remember listening to that in 2008 and sounds today as, as a prophecy that was in Moidumbi. So you had late slavery, slavery ended at the beginning of the 20th century, subjugation through the First World War, concessionary companies, colonial domination, 10 years of liberation war with executions, military discipline, then you had revolutionary violence, civil war, um, and so on and so forth. That's sort of in this space. And I think if you if we look at some of the constants of this violence um, in the history of Cabo de Gado, we are seeing that those things are happening again with this insurgency. Civ 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 civilians are being caught in between the, the hammer and the anvil between the insurgents and the forces, the defenses and seguranza. And this, for instance, has been happening in the, I've been, I've been sort of keeping abreast of the events in Mudumbi through, you know, people could phone to. And there's the same case, you know, so the, 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 the dynamics on the ground is the insurgents move in, the, the, the militias try to resist, they are not, not properly armed. Um, the, so the FDS often flee. This, as Salvador said, these are young soldiers who are fighting for, for what they perceived as a corrupted elite. They leave their, their, their weapons behind. Um, the insurgents move in, and especially there on the Maconde Plateau, they, so they've been killing whoever they meet. So the civil populations flee. The army, now, when they regain the territory, they loot. Uh, the insurgents loot, the army loots, and there are possibly even local breakaway militias who, who loot. Um, that's what appears to be the situation on the ground. There, there is mil militarization, so people have, since the, since the 70s, people have been integrated into, into militias with the liberation struggle, with the civil war, and these militias already in the 80s were used from one side and the other, from Renamo and Frelimo, to carry out atrocities. Um, they, are, they were on the ground a so-called Grupo Doze, the sort of local um, community police called after the 2000s, which are, which are basically militia groups, and which are now being reactivated. To defend, and then there is, of course, also a history of, of 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 banditry as an option, which seems to be a factor in this conflict. Um, I don't know how much time I have, maybe one or two minutes. Uh, the other point I wanted to put—you just ring a bell when I'm done with my time. The other point I wanted to put on the table is ethnic fault lines, um, which has a long history. Histories of Indian Ocean slavery, this kind of friction between Maconde and Mwani, um, to the point that the Maconde in Tanzania were integrated. Well, they were one of the sort of core people of the Zanzibar revolution who participated in the, in the Zanzibar genocide. So it's a, it's a long history. Uh, and it could have been also a very peaceful history, but clearly it's sort of, it has been stirred up to be a factor at this point. And we, we don't know to what extent, but if you look at this map, for instance, this comes from, uh, well, the second one comes the Observatorio do, 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 do Rural. And you see that the fault line of the insurgency is, in fact, the sort of Mwani Maconde friction line. And one can see it has been observed that in the, in the latest occupation of Moidumbi, there is a level of violence which sort of seems to indicate that, you know, there is no possible space of. Um, conversion or winning hearts and minds in that space, um, okay? And then finally, the last point, or some points on the table. I mean, I remember speaking, um, I think Joan was there last year in Pemba, and I sort of spoke about, you know, the risk of the ghost of the, ghost of the Eastern Congo, the risk of Cabo Delgado turning into a Kibo. Um, and unfortunately, a year down the line, we are already there. 
And so a few questions that I would like to just put on the table. Um, the first is what is the role of the militias in this conflict? There seems to be, there seems to be a, a role. I mean, there was, there, was, there was news last day and we don't know how this news operates, but of the, there's for sure news from the ground that there's been conflict within the militias and the FDS on the ground. Um, and sometimes they, they kill each other by mistake because the insurgents use FDS uh, traje. Um, so what is the role of the militia? Second question, the insurgents seem to have this technique um, of emptying out. So there's not, it, it, it's not exactly the same as Renamo was doing, as it was trying to build some support, even as, as it used the scorched earth approach. But here, and I mean, Lyazat Bonate made this connection with the management of savagery, savagery as his manifesto, where, you know, the technique seems to be, you know, you kill everybody and whoever is left after the reign of terror is gonna be the person who, who participate in the caliphate. So is this the technique that has been used? What's happening in Mosimbo? We don't even know that exactly. Um, and is there, be a, is there gonna be a total social breakdown in uh, Cabo Delgado? Another question to put on the table, what is, what, what is going to happen with the resettling of the IDPs, uh, internally displaced people? Um, I have some information that, for instance, some of the people that are coming from the Maconda areas are trying to cluster in previous spaces that were um, used by Maconda refugees after the liberation war. So it's just some sort of ethnic pattern that is going to happen there. Um, these are questions on the table. I'm aware my time must have completely run out, so I'm done. I just want to show a few photos as we as you know as this conflict turns the names of places and you know and into sites of atrocity we forget that Cabo Delgado is a region rich with history art life and joy so just to show a few pictures of another Cabo Delgado this was Matambalale village in the 80s with Mapico masquerades Mambula um, initiation rituals Mapico dancing uh, this was Muatidi, where the alleged mass mass beheadings have taken place, still not confirmed. Niangalewa, uh, with a depiction of Masais. This is a village that's been emptied out since March this year. Uh, and again, Niangalewa. Uh, and I would like to end with this photo of Litamanda village in Makomia, also emptied out. And yeah, with this sort of image of emptiness and art, which seems to be sim symbolic of what's going on there at the moment. Thank you very much, and sorry for stealing a few minutes. No, it's uh, all words are important. Thank you, Paolo, always for this uh, poetic uh, vision of uh, violence and and uh, and strife, um, but also with some beauty. Uh, I did have a question uh, from Björn. Uh, who who was one of our panelists um, last week, uh, which I think goes into what you discussed, uh, even though the question was uh, directed at Salvador. So any one of you or both of you can answer this. And uh, I will frame the, the question within my own question based on your presentation, Paolo. Uh, so you said that there is a particular violence and there is a... a, a, a um, uh, a historical clash between the Maconde and, and, and the Mwani. And I also mentioned the, the, the visible face of Mwani leadership um, in some of the videos of the insurgents that have been circulating in social media. Uh, but uh, as you also said last week, Maconde are also part of the insurgents. So there, the, there is that as well. And this goes into the question that um, Bjorn has asked uh, um, is there anything else that can be said about the popular support for insurgency? So if there is particular violence that is happening, uh, but still uh, there is some population support. So Paolo Salvador. Maybe does Salvador want to go start first? I think he's got more, I mean, I can say a few words, but let, let, maybe he should go first. I mean, Salvador. I don't know. <laughs> He's got more solid. I, I think all of you can turn on your cameras now, actually. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, the, 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 this is one of the tricky questions, I would say, of all these uh, 
um, problem of insurgency in Cap Delgado. And um, uh, of course, uh, um, we can talk about uh, popular support, but not in the same way as, for example, Renamo had popular support, support as we know, during the civil war. But, uh, in one of the attacks to Mosimba da Praia, and um, uh, when the insurgents came, the insurgents came to the to the uh, small town Mosimba da Praia, they um, uh, had um, support from people, uh, local people. But for me, the most important thing is to look at the way um, the insurgency itself uh, benefit from these um, logistical point of view. I mean, people trying, for example, to, um, to, um, to, to, to have weapons in their, their own uh, homes and trying to help insurgents themselves, uh, uh, trying to give information uh, with regard to the, uh, the, 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 the way um, uh, uh, defense forces uh, uh, is, uh, is in the region, uh, but especially um, uh, the support is mostly with regard to the logistical side of the, uh, of the, uh, the insurgency itself. Uh, and it would not be possible, at least very, very difficult the, for the insurgents itself to develop on the ground without this kind of support coming from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, local population. Of course, we cannot talk about massive support and that would not be correct. I mean, uh, looking at what is going on on the ground. Uh, Paolo? Um, yes, I mean, I don't have very much hard data about that, uh, but the, 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 the two things I can say is that um, as to the Maconde, there seems to be less support overall, but uh, I know of one case, for instance, of a young man who um, went um, to, the, to the ruby mines, disappeared in the ruby mines, and then came back as, a, as an insurgent as an insurgent. Um, so I think I, my sense is that there are, in, in that side at least, there, there was a sort of gerontocracy of the liberation struggle, sort of war veterans and stuff, and, and, a, and a lot of disaffection from young, from young people. So that could be one factor. And, and clearly the ruby mines are one, as Salvador said, are one of the hiring um, grounds. Uh, there seems to be also the case of people being bought um, that's what I hear, at least, uh, that they are, you know, that the, the people are, I mean, people are, of, are offered money to enjoy. And I think the point uh, of, of banditry being one option, um, that's what I also hear from people on the ground, that, you know, um, well, you take up arms and you, and you move to a life of banditry. And that's one, regardless of what the ideology is. And we know that that, that was the case with, with Renam as well. Um, yeah. Uh, another thing to mention, I mean, one could, there was those videos that were, def that were posted on the social media after the Mosimboa um, first attacks, which seems to point to a sort of attempt of the insurgents to win hearts and minds there at least a little bit. So I think the situation is different in Mosimboa. It seems to be different in Mukojo. Uh, I mean, I happen to be in... Uh, Pangane, just uh, Pangane Mukojo, just as the insurgency began, 20, late 2017, and the sense there that the place had changed and there was a massive radicalization, grassroots kind of Islamist radicalization there. I mean that ha that had happened by by 2017, and and that, that's a no-go area. It's one of the li liberated zones. It so, so it appears of the insurgency. Uh, there's another question, but I don't know if you, I see on the chat. Uh, yeah, there are two questions. Uh, uh, one is for you uh, from, um, from Aslak, uh, who says uh, that um, he agrees uh, with your understanding that the current violence uh, within the context of history of war and violence in the country and specifically in Cap Delgado, um, but uh, you know what we know from the cur uh, from the current insurgency it is dominated by very young people uh, and then 
Uh, we know that external forces, Islamist or Maputo power holders are also directing the violence. Um, how much do we, is it really, how much does really the history of the old violence helps us understand the current uh, violence as opposed to the current grievances and fight for resources? I'd like you to be very brief and then we, we so we can go on to the other panelists and then we can return circle back because this is a very important question of youth. There is a question also of youth by Mallorca. So I think we, we might have to discuss the issue of youth at, at more length at the later, but if you could just answer briefly this. On youth, um, just a couple of weeks ago, Eric Modegino, who'd done some research on the field also, he, he disagrees with the idea that most of the insurgents are youth. They're not youth by local standards, even though they call themselves the youth. So that's a point in quite. I think it's just like, you know, if you, if, just to be, be very brief, if you, if, you throw, if you take a match and you throw it onto a very wet forest, it's not gonna catch fire. If you throw a match and you throw it on a dry, grasslands is going to catch fire. So I think that's the role of, of the free grace violence there. It's just like the, you know, riots in Mosimbo, I haven't mentioned, riots in Mosimbo in 2006, Montepuech, um, you know, the, the uprisings in 2000, there were a lot of little insurgencies before 2017 in Pangane and where we, so it was like dry, very dry and ready to be set mm -hmm. alight. And poverty is elsewhere in Mozambique and it's not happening this way. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure, Mallorca, just let me know if you think that this was enough to also answer your question that I didn't uh, read out loud, but it seems to go your way. If not, just uh, um, ask more details to be clarified if you feel that you want to know a little bit more. Uh, I would now move to Anna. Um, and let's go to Tanzania. I mean, there has been a lot of uh, talk. I was actually, I have heard about uh, uh, foreign fighters uh, and I have heard from different nations. I did not know the extent, uh, at least the way Salvador explained, of the Tanz Tanzanian leadership. So talk to us about the other side. <laughs> I'll try to. Thank you, Carmelisa. Thank you for organizing this. And thank you to all the other speakers for allowing me to learn so much about this uh, ongoing conflict. Uh, I will speak more to the Tanzanian side, yes, because that's the, the one I'm uh, more familiar with. Uh, as you know, the, there was an attack uh, on the 15th of October in the village of Kitaya, which is on the Tanzanian side of the Ruma River. Uh, and uh, there were about, some reports say 200 or 300 insurgents who attacked the military compound and a cashew nut plant and uh, even also a medical clinic that was there. And the Twitter feed of the Islamic State in the Central African province claimed responsibility for the attack. And there were some videos circulating from it and so on. Uh, most of the attackers then retreated to the Mozambican side, but some were also arrested and it became clear that uh, several of them were Tanzanian nationals. Uh, now, the, this happened only 12 days before the Tanzanian national elections, which were held on October 28th this year. So from what can be understood from the communication of uh, the Islamic State itself, it was unrelated to the actual uh, Tanzanian election, even though they were reported to say, we'll come to get Magafuli and things like that. But uh, it is most widely understood as being unrelated. So security in the south of Tanzania was already quite uh, tight, even from 2017, when the unrest started in Mozambique, but it was even more so in October 2020. But the military presence was not only due to surveying insurgency or smuggling or transborder crime as, as the agreement between Tanzania and, and Mozambique called it, but also to monitor, or some would say more than monitor, voter registration in the country in the run-up to the election. 
So the attacks in, uh, in Kitaya led to further mobilization of the Tanzanian army along the border and also set in motion cross-border operation and Tanzanian shelling across the Ruvuma, uh, wounding and displacing people on the Mozambican side and thus putting them in a, the civilians in an even tighter squeeze than they already were from before. Uh, and now in November, the security forces of Tanzania and Mozambique has agreed to conduct joint operations. And I think the terminology they used was criminal gangs uh, operating transborder. So this attack was not really the first of its kind, but it was the most violent and the most blatant. And, and the reactions afterwards in Tanzania, I would say, has been relatively muted, strangely so, or maybe not strangely so, because uh, all reactions in Tanzania are very tightly monitored and, and uh, information, uh, freedom of information was even uh, tighter due to the election. So what I will do here, I'll try to identify some reactions that have been in Tanzania afterwards. Uh, and I will focus on three different categories, I think. One is related to the political situation in Tanzania at the moment. The second is the so-called Tanzanian connection of uh, where are the Tanzanian radicals? And, and third is simply the general bewilderment of what's going on, more or less the same questions as we are asking here in this seminar. So as, uh, as you know, Tanzania has more or less consistently since the 1998 attacks in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi, uh, been quite vocal about countering Islamic terror, and it has done so relatively consistently. And in the general literature, uh, most of the concern has been to explain the relative absence of terrorist attacks inside uh, Tanzania, especially typically in, in Zanzibar. And the explanation given has often been that the high degree of politicization in Tanzania, and paradoxically also the very strong polarization between the CCM and its opposition, its various oppositions, uh, now Chadema or ACT Wazalendo in Zanzibar, has left kind of little room for, uh, for uh, political jihadism in that sense. Uh, it's also kind of paradoxical that the increased and very worrying limitations placed on freedom of speech by Magafuli's government has made those who oppose his government flock to the opposition. Uh, so, but in anticipation of the elections now, CCM and Magafuli had already lowered the 4G internet speed and they placed uh, limitations on Twitter and WhatsApp, you could only access by VPN and so on. So it meant that on the ground reports from Tuara were quite limited and all information regarding the attacks were tightly controlled by the Tanzanian government. Uh, it's unclear which, if this was due to the election or due to the security concerns, but probably both. So uh, the Mtwara region is the prospected location for Tanzania's LNG plant. It's the, the site of a pipeline, uh, LNG pipeline with Shell and Equinor as the main partners and so on. It's a highly important region for the government. Uh, but unrest has been simmering in the South uh, for a long time. For example, CCM decided to reroute cashew nut exports from, from the region to, to go via Dar es Salaam and not uh, exported out directly, which sparked a lot of local reactions. And then very predictably, of course, it caused uh, members, or it caused people in the region to join Chadema, the opposition, and also very predictably in the run up to the election, Chadema pledged to make uh, Mtuara a new economic hub and it would not feed the stomachs of Dar es Salaam and cashew growers could export freely and, uh, and so on. Also in the run-up to the election, uh, several Chadema and ACT politicians were arrested and or disappeared for weeks. And some of them were also actually charged with uh, endangering, pub what is it? endangering public security or aiding and abetting terrorism. Uh, but in fact, uh, most of these charges were dropped or they were changed. And uh, most of the opposition leaders were released. So we may 
scientists have maybe concluded that CCM is using the southern border problem as an excuse to keep opposition members in detention. But in fact, I think this is not the case. Uh, several of the detainees have spoken of their after their release and pointed primarily to the political motives of their own arrest. But it's surely the case that CCM was extremely heavy handed in their path to their so-called election victory. And it came only at the cost of actually having political pris prisoners again in Tanzania. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is this reaction is so-called, uh, people say, yeah, it's a wake up call. What, what has happened in Mozambique can happen here and we need to respond to it quickly or, oops. And, uh, and we need to find the Tanzanian connection. <clears throat> so it was said in the previous panel that Mozambique is very fertile ground for conspiracy theories. And this is also very much true in Tanzania. Tanzanian police say that they have identified several Tanzanians in these attacks and that they have signed this uh, contract to collaborate on cross-border crime. Uh, for about as long as the insurgency in Mozambique has uh, been around, so has the theories of the Tanzanian connection. Some commentaries speak in terms of groundwork now being laid for jihadist activism all over East Africa. It's the ghost of Abu Drogo, they say, who was killed in Mombasa in 2012. Another conspiracy surfacing is that Chadema or ACT activists are aiding any insurgency in Tanzania, simply to discredit the Magafuli government. Uh, this uh, charge was actually directed at Tundulisu, who was blamed for this after going into exile in, in Germany immediately after the election. CCM has also blamed the tendency towards organizations keeping mercenaries, which is uh, also a reference to, to banditry, uh, transport of banditry which may be interpreted as feeding into yet another conspiracy theory. This is probably very fringe uh, <coughs> statements. In Zanzibar, for example, ACT was a land of the opposition yesterday or the day before yesterday, <coughs> actually chose to join CCM in the government of national unity. And I, and I think this is interesting and also kind of worrying because it may threaten to break up the opposition. <laughs> and it was an odd thing to see that during the negotiations for joining uh, the government of national unity, opposition leaders came sort of limping, still, still bruised from the beating they received after or in the, in, during the election times. So many others, and especially young people, young members of the oppositions are objecting strongly to entering any kind of alliance. Then finally, the third and final point I want to raise is Simply the, the bewilderment that uh, you see in sort of general comments. Predictably, Muslim leaders call for calm, like the National Muslim Council in Tanzania. This happens on a regular basis. Uh, uh, it's actually still a lot of the uh, internet is partly down in, or very slow in Tanzania. But you see pretty much the same questions that we are discussing. Some Islamic organizations have expressed a kind of understanding for the insurgency in Cabo Delgado and then citing mostly capitalist companies and complying governments that will not bring a lot of development or progress for the people. So where are we now? We are well at the stage where of course, probably this will cause further delays to the LNG plant in Lindy. Zanzibar government setting up the government of national unity which threatens to break the opposition at least in two. Uh, the question is if Tanzania will make the same or CCM Tanzania mainland will make the same move in the face of growing unrest. And if they do so, how, well, how will that be? I think it's unlikely because Magafuli's government now probably views itself as the one institution capable of dealing with this. But if they do enter into some kind of alliance, then what, how, how, what would be the responses to that? So I am there. 
Thank you so much, Anne. I'm always fascinated and uh, there is not enough that we know and, and understand of our neighbors and I think it's, it's similar. So uh, I, I do have a couple of questions that I will ask later on, but there is a theme here and I will invite Antonio because he's the one who's technically supposed to discuss this theme, which is the theme of banditry and the connection between crime and terrorism. Antonio, I will give you the floor now. Uh, thanks, Carmelis. Um, yeah, just to share a few um, uh, thoughts on that. Uh, um, uh, I mean, the debate about uh, uh, the overlapping of different kind of uh, forms of violence uh, and, um, and crime uh, is very much polarized in the literature, uh, in the social sciences. Um, so, for instance, there is a, a conspicuous body of research and then and scholarship that insists that uh, contemporaneity is characterized by a, a growing convergence um, of uh, uh, terrorist networks, uh, criminal organizations and syndicates uh, and so on. Um, at times, this kind of scholarship uh, is characterized by um, a certain degree of uh, sensationalism. Um, and a lack of empirical data. And in fact, on the other side, there are those who kind of uh, try to disrupt these um, sensationalist uh, narratives, saying that the empirical data suggests that uh, these uh, new phenomena are um, not so new, first of all, and that also they, they do not present uh, characteristics of being very vertical, for example, but rather horizontal in nature and so on. Um, so, for instance, there will be uh, in, in the journal I edited uh, um, public anthropologist a special issue, uh, the, the next issue, uh, which will focus on the convergence of uh, different kind of um, uh, networks. Uh, in, in the, the special issue will focus specifically on uh, the supposed convergence between uh, smuggling, human smuggling, and uh, and other crimes like uh, narcotraffic and so on. Uh, trying to understand what happens on the ground. Um, in, in, for example, in, in, the, in the conclusion of the special issue, Peter Andreas, who has been uh, uh, studying uh, different, this kind of networks for a while now, is particularly skeptical about uh, uh, the novelty of this uh, phenomenon or also the magnitude in, to some extent. Uh, for example, he suggests that a particularly uh, popular narrative regarding the security dimensions of the illicit global economy is that there is a rapidly growing conver convergence between criminal, terrorist, and insurgent networks, uh, what some authors have labeled the crime terror insurgency nexus, and that this presents a clear and actual danger. Um, however, the, this alleged convergence is mostly asserted rather than empirically demonstrated. And uh, of course, some journalists and analysts have warned that the terror, crime and corruption have, for example, fundamentally changed, uh, changed in recent years, becoming increasingly inter intertwined and therefore represent an alarming new global security threat. But saying that, uh, for instance, terrorists uh, use fake IDs uh, or they deal drugs or bribe cops and other officials is not the same as making the case uh, that crime, corruption, and terrorism have rapidly converged and transformed into an unprecedented threat. Uh, another aspect, for example, that Peter, Peter Andreas uh, remarks is that uh, in many cases, terrorist and criminal interests are not only not the same, but not the same, but may even uh, clash. Uh, for example, migrant smugglers and uh, drug, drug traffickers benefit from porous borders and their business uh, interest would be undermined by a border shutdown in the wake of a major terrorist border incident. Uh, in a similar way, while many assume that criminals and terrorists thrive on chaos, uh, many criminals actually benefit from a more stable and predictable business environment. So therefore there are different levels that, that has to be considered. Um, there are, uh, uh, of course, uh, instances of convergence uh, where the nexus of different kinds of forms of uh, political uh, uh, violence and criminal networks are more clear. Uh, 
uh, if we think uh, the Afghan case, for example, uh, we have an armed group like the Taliban, uh, which has a pol strong political uh, dimension configuration in the country. Uh, but it, it, also, it is, of course, uh, an armed group with connections with the terrorist networks, and at the same time, is uh, is a group and movement uh, uh, that uh, largely benefit from uh, controlling part of the narco traffic in Afghanistan. So, in that case, for example, these kind of convergences are there and, uh, and should be explored. Um, so, yeah, this was just a quick note to to emphasize uh, the need of empirical research. When it comes to, of course, it's it's a difficult field to research empirically. But, uh, that's what we need: uh, emp empirical research to understand the dimensions, the magnitude, and the reality on the ground of this kind of uh, different convergences and the overlapping of networks of insurgency, uh, political uh, um, extremism, uh, criminal networks, and so on. Uh, thank you, Antonio. So last, uh, last week, uh, ASLAC presented uh, on uh, six scenarios, and the first scenario was actually um, how there is a convergence that is similar to what happens to Al-Shabaab. Um, and also, um, uh, Stig Yale talked about illicit uh, uh, transnational um, flows of money and I think that it was a lot of talk here about uh, this, uh, uh, this transference of, of money to, to young people. Um, when you talk about these different levels, where would you put this? When can we consider that there is a convergence or, and, or that the, the interests are aligned? And when is it this horizontal that you talk about? How can we differentiate between one and the two? Uh, well, it really depends on the context, but uh, for instance, if we think about uh, the, the mainstream debate about uh, the convergence between human smuggling and, and criminal networks or terrorism, for example, there we see that uh, empirical research show that uh, the situation is much more chaotic uh, and, and bottom up than, uh, you know, Hollywood uh, representation would suggest. Um, so we do have a lot of uh, f several forms of interaction, but uh, mostly are, for example, enacted by people uh, for survival means at times. So people who approach um, groups or uh, smugglers uh, in order to, you know, to to reach, for example, a destination and so on. So uh, it, it, this is this is what I refer to when I say that the, the vertical dimension of the phenomenon. Is um, it's sometimes uh, more in the in the eyes of the of the analyst rather than uh, in the experience of people who are who are on the ground. So the, the, what is an issue there is whether there are uh, uh, or yes or not barrier uh, to barriers to to you know to um, uh, help people not to access uh, different kind of criminal networks or terrorist groups. Uh, and, and I think that's where, for example, the anal analysis can focus uh, in trying to understand that uh, very, very often it is the case that there are no these kind of barriers. So uh, migrants who want to migrate, for example, they are exposed to criminal networks and, and terrorists uh, in, a, in a very easy fashion. Um, and of course, in, in that case, this facilitates the development of uh, networks that are unstable and difficult to grasp in, in, their, in their nature and magnitude. Hmm. Thank you. No, that is, uh, uh, there are excellent points. Uh, I have here questions that I think are coming in for uh, not uh, necessarily uh, you, but generally. Um, and uh, also, I think some of the points that you make all, all go into the, the whole issue of when you're talking about migration, I think we can also talk about uh, internal displacement that you always going to talk about, uh, because one of the arguments is that in, insurgents can be uh, hidden within migrants. So whether crossing borders or um, or within uh, the, the internally displaced. So let me just uh, read some of the questions that are here. I have a question for Anne from Paolo. 
who says, uh, actually two questions. How does the Tanzania military and intelligence expertise compare to Mozambican? And why, in your view, international jihadist networks target Northern Mozambique rather than Southern Tanzania for intervention? The, for the intervention, resources, state weakness, more marginalized Muslim populations. And question two, do you know something about the mysterious Northern Kivu connection, ADF, ISCAP? So that is from Paolo. Can you? Uh, and I can try it. Yeah, and then there is the... one from Aslak, and I will ask you afterwards. There were many questions from Paolo. I saw them, and they, they are all uh, interesting. I, I, I'm not really in a position to evaluate the uh, security forces of the of the two countries. I, I do think maybe Tanzania has a longer. I mean, they they have they have always been concerned with Ntuara in the south. So it's not like they are there suddenly. They they are there so and have been there. Uh, Regarding the the targeting of northern Mozambique, I I I was struck by uh, Paulo's um, presentation actually because it something uh, to do with the legacy of violence itself uh, is maybe part of it here. Uh, certainly more marginalized, but uh, that's not to say that the population of uh, of southern Tanzania is not also marginalized. But maybe this uh, legacy of violence is not that present. This is, of course, something that would have to be researched properly and uh, fully. But uh, it, it just struck me during the presentation. About the Kivu uh, connection, I really don't know. This is why I was saying this is so ripe with conspiracy theories that once you start getting into the Twitter feeds on this, you, you get lost. It's uh, it's hard, really hard to say. Sorry, I I, so I, I do not have an answer. Uh, and Aslak asks you still, Anna. Uh, you mentioned that Islamic leaders are basing part of their understanding of the insurgency in Mozambique on their own criticism of capitalist companies in in Tanzania. Uh, Aslak says he's never heard that the insurgents in Mozambique have uttered explicit explicit criticism against such capitalist companies, for instance, the petroleum companies. If this is correctly a difference, is it a clue to understanding interests in Mozambique? Actually, I was a bit surprised myself. There were some statements uh, by Hezbo Tahrir in Tanzania and also by sort of local Muslim leaders. This was particularly Zanzibar, uh, which was offering this critique in <laughs> almost like Marxist terminology, uh, which was kind of surprising, the, the sort of fusion of, uh, of concepts and language here. Uh, why they chose to do this? Again, I I'm, I'm tend to locate it in the, in the context of the Tanzanian election, say, blaming Magafuli's government for being in the pocket of the big companies and so on and so forth, you know whether that places them with the political opposition or beyond it uh, as, as a sort of uh, Islamist response is, is very hard to say. And again, this polarization between CCM and its opposition tend to lead all opposition into the pocket of the political government, except for the really radicalized uh, portions. Yeah. Um... Well, I, 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 I have a question for you that is not necessarily the link to your presentation, but it is a link to your specialty, which is Salafis and Wahhabism. Uh, and uh, the <laughs> its influence in the region, it, ha it has been hinted out in some of the presentations. Um, and and uh, Bonat uh, Riazat, she talks uh, extensively about this and how this connection has not been broken. It's part of the, the heritage. So it's not a heritage of violence, but the heritage of connections and transnational connections of the region. The region. 
And Liazad has recently made uh, a presentation about the potential for jihadism and the existence of jihadist uh, uprisings before this one, uh, even during colonial times. Uh, so um, can you comment a bit about this on the history of jihadism in the region? Because I think that sometimes Liazat says this, and I agree, this is forgotten. And, and our surprise here that this could have happened perhaps is misplaced. Yeah, no, I, I uh, well, actually my specialty is uh, the opposite, the <laughs> Sufi networks and the traditional networks. And I, to the, to the best of my ability, try to ignore that they change their faces every now, every now and then. And I agree very much with Liazat and her her work and also it's a it's a broader understanding if you look at these traditional networks that are Islamic networks whether you call them Sufi or whatever they are learned networks and it's a general theory saying that these are the long-standing uh, networks reinforced with by family by intermarriage by trade and so on and so forth and they can localize more or less anything because they have the capacity to do so. Uh, which means that they can also localize Islamic reform of all sorts. They can localize uh, resistance to colonialism, for example, which Liazat has pointed out and which they have done. And they can localize Salafism and jihadism if the conditions are right, if the terrain is dry, like Paolo said. They, they also have the capacity to do so. So we shouldn't look at this as only in ideological terms, but also as sort of existing networks that can have the capacity to localize whatever the condition demands in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I think that is an excellent point is uh, how it is possible to embed and what is the characteristics like Stig said last, last week, uh, that they take on the local grievances and they exactly. very much localize and it becomes an internal aspect. So it's very much easy to incorporate. That's what it makes it easier uh, to set fire, <laughs> basically mm -hmm. on the dry terrain. Uh, João, um, I, I would like you to join us now and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the visible consequence, which has been the internal, internally displaced people. Um, and we have um, definitely uh, talked about certain aspects of movement, of uh, cross-border. There have been refugees from, uh, to Tanzania that has been sent back to Mozambique. But currently, what it, most of the people are actually internally displaced, and you have just recently published on this. And uh, so, what is your, um, your what are your findings? Uh, yes. Um, uh, good morning, Karen Lisa, and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, enter to this group and. Um, to hear uh, from you and to share uh, also what uh, we hear in uh, Observatorio do Meio Rural, what we have been doing. Uh, actually, we we have been uh, let me charge my battery. We have been in uh, Cabo Delgado um, last month, and uh, we visit the. The refugee camps. The government doesn't call refugee camps. Uh, it calls uh, well resettlement camps. Um, uh, we we visit uh, um, Pemba, um, and we also visit Matuja, uh, where are um, a, a big amount of uh, uh, IDPs, internal displaced people. Uh, my team also go to um, to Montpuesh and to Balama. Um, uh, so the situation uh, I have, uh, we we publish me Yusuf Adam and uh, and Jerry uh, and Jerry McKenz, uh, We publish uh, some. Um, uh, 
a policy brief about this. And uh, I have some maps that I will try to share with you. Uh, let me see how can I do it. Uh, okay, I think it's working now. Okay, I think you are seeing. Uh, actually, Paulo also shared this map. Uh, the left map shows uh, the areas where we have uh, seen uh, uh, attacks. Uh, so this uh, semester, as all you know, uh, the attacks spread uh, to south and to the Macon, the plateau, and they are um, now in Muidum, and also in Angad, and in, uh, also in Moeda. And uh, this provoke uh, a set of uh, um, uh, displacement of, of migration of people that you see now in the in the map uh, on the right side. The places where the displaced people are now uh, concentrated. So this orange color means um, high density of population. So we can see on the periphery of the conflict area, uh, a concentration of many displaced people. Uh, so uh, this phenomena has uh, consequences uh, in the strategy of the war uh, because uh, the population is moving from the occupied areas and go and go away. So uh, it means that the Al Shabaab lost uh, uh, many people where they can uh, kidnap and uh, and uh, and to join to, to the group, uh, including young and women. Uh, it means that uh, they lost the access to logistics, which includes food. And, uh, and includes uh, information and uh, people who can uh, help on transport and all these things. And uh, it, make, it creates pressure to go to areas where they can uh, steal food. And uh, I believe that one of the motivations to enter in the plateau of uh, Muidumbe was to steal food. It doesn't, I'm not saying that it was the only or the main motivation, but it was one of them, I believe one of the motivation. Because they are not, it, we, we, don't, we don't have many information about the, the, the ways that they use for local administration of these areas. We believe that there are some concern about that, but we don't have many, many information. But we also believe that um, uh, it's starting to be very complicated to have to create logistics to 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 feed so many people uh, because there are reports that there are thousands of uh, of men now. Uh, so uh, on the other on on the other hand, so th this is very useful for the government actually because the 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 water is now. Uh, uh, the, so the, the fish is losing the water using this Maoist metaphor. So this is a good uh, strategy to fight uh, guerrilla. And on the other hand, uh, the this displaced people are concentrated in areas that facilitate the access of humanitarian help that the government can uh, capitalize for political uh, for political reasons. Uh, we also notice that in these areas uh, where the uh, resettlement, where, where the, the IDPs are concentrated, are areas where the, where the most poor used to go. I mean, the, the people who had more healthy, uh, normally the, the more healthy people that has uh, money uh, to, to, to afford, that, that who can afford to travel, uh, uh, of all the family normally used to go to the main cities of uh, Montpuej or to uh, Pemba or even to Nampula. Uh, and the most poor 
uh, normally they walk, so they cannot go to long distance. So that's why they concentrated in the closest areas of the conflict. Um, in inside the, the inside the, the, the these small resettlement camps, we also uh, can understand uh, the different waves of refugees. Uh, so the people who have uh, come before, they have already access to tents uh, or, or to better conditions and the ones who have uh, recently come, they, they have uh, uh, not so good conditions. Um, they are uh, resettled according to the village of origin, which means that soon as they arrive, uh, there are some officials from the government that uh, identifies them and, uh, uh, and try to uh, orientate them uh, to, to, to a place of destiny according to the village from they were born or from they were coming. Uh, we, the, the problems of these camps, you can imagine, uh, um, first of all, we, 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 we find that the excess of natural resources, it's a big problem. I mean, woods, I mean, coal, um, in areas where there is a, a lot of pressure for these goods, uh, for, for these natural resources, it, it's starting to become a problem to get it. People have to walk um, many kilometers uh, to find it. Um, we, we see that uh, uh, local population are trying to get advantage of these, uh, 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 of these people who have access to food. Uh, you know, um, that we, we found uh, situations of people, local people are trying to change one bowl of cassava leaves for one bowl of rice. Uh, and local people have to accept because they don't have uh, access to land and they cannot make mashamba, so they have to, to accept the, the conditions um, that they are facing. Uh, we see um, uh, 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 some stress between the established and these outsiders uh, because uh, the outsiders normally um, are, are seeing as people who are being disturbing because they are building their latrines close uh, to the to, to, to close to the houses of people who are already living there. Uh, sometimes we we heard stories about they call us al shababs because we are running away from the war. Uh, we found some. Um, people complaining about Islamophobic uh, attitudes. Uh, so uh, we also found situations of uh, women who are um, uh, uh, who have to to prostitute in order to 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 get uh, access to to food. Um, in some in some uh, places, according to the EOM, according to the EOM data, in some places, we found that the majority of the population, the adult population, are women, especially in the south, in Namuno, but also in Makumiya and these areas close to the coast. Uh, in some places more than 70% of adults are women. Um, so this creates uh, this uh, speech that all uh, the, the majority of, of uh, and especially, normally they are Moanish, people from the coast. And they, this creates the speech that the Moanese women left their, their husbands in the bush where they are fighting uh, for the Al Shababs, and they are here. Um, in Montpuech, we have uh, uh, we 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 hear stories in the in the in the barracas, in the local pubs at night uh, that people already drunk were 
were turning to uh, money, woman, and call them, hey, you al Shabab. So this this thing, this this uh, situation exists. And uh, another thing, I think it would be important uh, to say is um, is that uh, uh, the the color problem in this uh, in this uh, in these camps is a reality. Uh, especially in Matuj, we have reports that uh, uh, last week or two weeks ago there were uh, situations of cholera, and uh, um, people uh, were uh, uh, local people accused uh, uh, people from humanitarian help that put cholera in the in the holes. This is a, a traditional a traditional uh, incident that we uh, we find. Uh, uh, in in uh, in the north of, of Mozambique, and the people are saying that uh, it's not good to stay here. It, it would be better to return to the original village because at least over there we didn't have cholera. At least over there we had more space to live and we had uh, better conditions. Um, uh, I would just like to say that. Uh, there are uh, 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 close relations, at least in Matuj, we found that people that are in these camps, they have relations to their places of origins where they used to go several times to collect uh, cassava or to see if their house were burdened or, if, or to try to, uh, to bring uh, some tools that they, they left there. So they still have this uh, come and go to the places of origins, uh, which creates the uh, uh, feeling of distrust in order to these people. No one knows who is who. Uh, no one trusts no one, including in the same family. People don't trust each other. So this uh, feeling of distrust is... Uh, is very um, dominant in uh, Cabo Delgado uh, these days. Um, I think that's all I have to uh, share with you. And this is going to be the, the, the next day, uh, the, the, the following days, uh, we are going to face this uh, challenge of resettle uh, uh, almost half a million people. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be a huge effort from the government because these these people has to go to places where there is no uh, infra infrastructures, uh, public services like uh, health or or or, or uh, education. So uh, this is going to be a huge phenomena and. Um, and uh, and uh, it's going to be a huge challenge for for the government and for the humanitarian organizations, of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you, João. Uh, it is um, well. It it has been so far, and uh, I think it 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 still is an under research uh, area, which is the the effect of uh, internal displacement. It's also has become a bigger phenomenon now than before. Uh, maybe I would like you to comment a little bit on the reluctance of the government in calling these refugee camps or even calling these people refugees or accepting that they were refugees only now when the numbers have become so big. Uh, have has the government accepted that there are internally displaced people. This is one thing. And the second thing. Uh, I would like you to comment on this issue of resettlement and the effort of resettlements. Recently, it has been announced that there will be a hundred villages built. And does this mean that the government does not expect people to return to their places of origin? Um, and then Paolo also has a question here. He had two questions. In relation to food, Eric Maurier Genot mentioned that the Al Shabaab are ideologically against agriculture, so they would forbid agriculture in the places they control. Is this true? And second question Do you know something about organization of milicianos around Mueda and beyond? 
Uh, I would also encourage the other participants, uh, in case you haven't put your question, you're free to do so. Uh, João, please, <laughs> you have many questions on your hand. Yes, um, I believe that th there is a, a double speech from the government. One thing is what they say to the uh, in public, to the civil society, to, to the mass media. Another thing is what they say in private to donors and to the humanitarian organization. So um, there is this uh, attitude from the beginning to deny this problem and to say, oh, this is not a big deal. Everything is under control. The, the government uh, is controlling everything. Everything is okay. But on the other hand, in private, there is this asking for help for the World Food Program that, uh, that is very well installed in the north of Mozambique. Actually, um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, the, uh, Mozambique is a country that the World Food Program knows very well uh, for the worst reasons since the last years. So um, we, I, I have to, we, we have to understand this uh, attitude from the government as a political attitude. Of course, the government uh, never uh, can recognize uh, that doesn't have control from the situation. So, um, and, and another thing, uh, I, I think, I think the, because the government knows that they don't have capacity also, he doesn't recognize, he knows that he doesn't have military capacity to recover the occupied areas. So the government knows that it's very important to take that population from the occupied areas. That population cannot be there because they, they can be an easy target for the, for, for, to, for, for, for the, for the Mashababush and, uh, and to support the Mashababush in terms of logistics, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, military, in terms of information and so on. So for the government, it's obvious that there is this, that, 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 that is, um, uh, re the, 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 this resettlement of, uh, of these half million people in far away from the um, uh, occupied areas is also, of course, is, this is an economic strategy in order to reintegrate um, economically and socially in the markets. But first of all, is also, I believe, a military strategy in order to take the water from the fish, as I, as I told during my presentation. As it was in the liberation struggle, this is the uh, Aldiamentos, uh, coloniais, colonial village from Caúza, General Caúza da Riaga. So they used the river, the river Masalo, as like the border between the plateau and the and the lowlands, where they concentrate all the people in this uh, colonial village in order to took the water from from the fish. So this is a a, a, a new version, a post-colonial version of the. Uh, colonial village without village. Also, also during the post-colonial uh, resettlement, sure, aldeias yeah, comunais sure. and... Uh, yeah, against, uh, against uh, the war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, there were several aldeias uh, communal village. Uh, there were communal village for this uh, uh, collective uh, uh, to, to, as a modern as a, a project of modernization of rural areas, but there was yeah. Also, colonial village for for uh, resulted with for, from the floods, mm -hmm. especially in Limpopo River and Zambezi River, and of course as a military uh, with a military purpose as well. Uh, I don't know if the Mashababus are against agriculture. It's honestly I never heard that. Uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know. Uh, uh, related to militias, what I what I heard is uh, what I heard in Muidum and in Nangat, uh, and and also in uh, uh, also in Montpuig. I heard that um, in in Montpuig, uh, 
the 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 government tried to convince the former freedom fighters to go to fight. They had meetings in order to call them to go to fight in the plateau. And uh, what I heard is that they answer that no, uh, when there were these uh, dividas ocultas, you eat the money alone, you didn't call us. So why should we go now? Uh, so I, I want to give this example to say that uh, all this story that uh, the former freedom fighters are, are heroes that are uh, controlling the situation in the field, it's much more complex. Um, in fact, they are defending the areas uh, when they are and they're living in Mudung or uh, in Nangad or in Mueda. Uh, and they are uh, very active in these places because they are defending their, their own land, their own house, their own families, and their own goods. So they are saving their own skin. So they have this motivation. But the level of discontentment among uh, these former freedom fighters is very high. Uh, on the other hand, uh, these, all these speeches about the, the militias and the group those that, um, that uh, Paolo uh, told about, uh, uh, talk about, um, he, he, I heard that some of these uh, people are selected because they are more confused. So people who are accused sometimes to be thieves or uh, to are not well integrated, people who drink and to fight and to have, and who are brave enough to go to belong to these militias. And these militias, uh, and they go to there in order to learn, go there and go to learn to be more, to have more discipline. And these militias are uh, managed by one, uh, former freedom fighter who had uh, military training and uh, who, who managed, who tried to manage and, uh, the, the, the situation in the field. But uh, I heard many stories about his, uh, I don't know, I think Paolo also heard many stories. We, we are trying to cross all this information. Um, I'm just sharing what I, what I am what I, uh, the stories the re that, that I got. Um, one last question before I move to, to leave. Uh, and then <laughs> we are well beyond the time that we, we were supposed to be. Uh, but um, I want to give enough time for Liv to present her, what, what will be, I think, a very interesting aspect of what, that needs to start being discussed as well. But one last question is, Aslak asked you to specify who are these former freedom fighters? I, I, I imagine he wants to know, are these related to the independence uh, war or to the, to the civil war or the, the second war? Well, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the ones who, who, are, who belong to the, uh, to the first war, the liberation uh, struggle, they are too old now. And uh, on the other hand, normally people who spend mu much time uh, in guerrilla, uh, normally they are not very healthy because it was a very demanding period. Uh, but uh, we had, uh, we know that uh, many times these, these are old people, more than 60 years old. So it means that they belong to the, to the first war. But I believe that this is a mix. I don't know if Jerry knows about that. Os antigos combatentes são da Primeira Guerra ou da Segunda Guerra? São da Guerra de Libertação ou da Guerra da Renan? Não, são da Libertação. Jerry uh, says that it's from, from the, the first war, the liberation 
So the these older, sure. these older men. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, no, I have heard about villages that are organized by these former liberation and, and that are extremely organized and um, and they still follow a military discipline. Naveta, even from yeah. Yeah. I heard about Naveta. Yeah. So um, I, I will turn now to leave and uh, especially because uh, finally women were mentioned uh, in Joan's uh, uh, Jean Feijos' uh, presentation about uh, um, displaced people. Uh, the, the whole um, conversation around women uh, in this war, and as you have seen, it's very male, very you know, youth and male, uh, but the whole conversation when women are mentioned is either they are kidnapped, they are the, to become sex slaves, some of them, uh, there was uh, in a social media uh, and uh, in a report by uh, Amnesty International, the case of a woman who was beaten and shot 36 times by the allegedly by the by military men, so the government military. Uh, and in the social media, what went around was that actually she was a witch and that witch women uh, were recruited by the insurgents to help them win. Uh, the war and the soldiers were very suspicious of women because they chanted and sang and made them lose their battles, um, which is a whole other conversation. But there have been also mentions of wives of insurgents uh, who have special intelligence and information. And there, uh, there has been also mention of uh, particular violence towards um, couples, uh, insurgent couples, which means that it's both men and women. And uh, Liazat Bonat, who I mentioned before, she talked about how there is, in the beginning of the insurgency, there was a participation of women. So women appear here and there, uh, but the dominant narrative has been uh, violence towards them and how are, they are victims of violence. Uh, as someone who does research Islam and gender, and uh, you know, um, I, I suspect you know you know this more than me, but I suspect having also uh, research on gender that there there is probably something missing on this general narrative on violence uh, that has been. Uh, on, on, on having this dominant narrative that uh, violence happening to women in the insurgency. Thank you so much, uh, Carmelisa. <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me to the panel. I, I've learned so much already <laughs> uh, because, um, yeah, obviously I'm not a Mozambique expert. So I will, I will talk on this topic for more uh, <clears throat> my own experience, which is uh, from field work in Sudan and also from uh, a project a Carnegie funded project I'm part of, um, which also includes uh, case studies from Algeria and um, Nigeria. But let me start by sharing my screen. Um, okay. Why is it? Okay, there it is. So, um, I think when we are talking about women and Islamic insurgency or other other sort of non-Islamic extremist uh, violent movements, um, it's important to acknowledge that women can take roles and in very sort of tabloid um, headlines here. Uh, I've put you know they can be victims of its violence. Uh, they can also be fighting against it in different ways and also joining it. Um, and uh, it's important to acknowledge uh, sort of the gender aspect here. Um, as you said, uh, Carmelisa, often it's very sort of male narrative, but women play, often play a central role and also often a very sort of symbolic role uh, because the ideologies of these movements often put the female body as sort of a battleground um, uh, between Islam and the West. So how women dress, behave, what role they take uh, as very sort of politically symbolic uh, power uh, in differentiating those women from other women, um, particularly those in the West, but not only. Um, so 
I would say, you know, we are throwing out a lot of concepts of like Islam and Salafist, uh, but <clears throat> what does it really mean? So I think one of the sort of defining sort of difference between Islamism and Salafism um, is that um, Salafis often reject the principle of the ikhtilaf, uh, that there is sort of a... Um, um, uh, there can be a, like a difference, a difference in opinion or interpretation of Islamic doctrine. Salafis say there's, you know, there's only one correct or authentic reading of the Islamic scripture, and all those who do not follow sort of the correct, authentic um, interpretation or, or, or reading of or, of the scripture, those are unbelievers. So the unbelievers are not only like the Westerners, but can also be, be uh, sort of uh, other Muslims who do not practice Islam in the correct way. So those are the kafir. And so in a way then different rules apply to, to Muslim women or the authentic Muslim women, those that are part of the movement, uh, and those who are considered kafir women, who can also be Muslim um, uh, women. Um, and so we hear these narratives often in the media about these horrendous crimes that are committed against women and also children of sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, so the Yazidi women under ISIS or kidnapping and sex um, uh, and women um, abducted and becoming sex slaves uh, under Boko Haram. Uh, and as you were saying, Carmelisa, um, a lot of stories coming out also from Mozambique of how, you know, women have been sort of a victim of, of this sort of violent extremist uh, 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 movement. Uh, but women can also play an important role in fighting against Islamic extremism. Um, and because the female body of, uh, is sort of a, a battleground, um, uh, women also take important role in stemming the tide of, of, of this sort of uh, type of ideologies and movements. And they can do this in the everyday. So the way they dress, move in public spaces, uh, uh, they potentially fight cultural wars in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and to give one example, the way that Algerian women uh, were at the front, front lines uh, during the Black Decade, um, they were sort of the, the first and initial targets of, of the violence because they were working as teachers, uh, they were working uh, in sort of public, um, taking roles in the public domain. And is Islamists came and said that this is sort of, a, um, this is not appropriate for women. Um, so by continuing to live your life as you, uh, as you think is, is correct, you were also uh, putting yourself in a, in a position where you became a target of, of Islamist violence. Um, you also see sort of civil society act activism, like women's organization are, uh, are working on the ground. One sort of um, example was like a march that turned into like the, I don't know, mo mo maybe the most known hashtag uh, in recent uh, years. Uh, about you know bring back our girls in Nigeria when the um, uh, to bring back sort of the uh, abducted like girls that have been adopted uh, abducted by Boko Haram, um, but also women in in North, Northeast Nigeria uh, are also working on the ground of uh, for example reintegrating those uh, abducted girls into society where there's a lot of stigma attached to being sort of held as a Sex slave or uh, uh, or forced into marriage uh, to to Boko Haram um, uh, soldiers, um, and women are also joining uh, these uh, movements. And I think that the, the narrative of the women who join um, that is most sort of frequent, at least in the media, is um, is based on this idea that women are a little bit in the background. So. Uh, or more uh, like passive participants as wives and mothers. So, uh, and this um, and this is 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 definitely true. So, um, um, it is um, considered like. 
some of the, uh, like I'm generalizing a lot here, but the ideology, uh, a lot of the ideology is based on a principle of complementarity, um, saying that you know women and men are biologically different and therefore have different rights and obligations. And as men cannot give birth to children and women can, women's primary role is as mothers. Uh, and in these movements, um, not only giving birth to children, but also ed educating the children to become good and authentic Muslims. So this is like the primary um, uh, role of a woman. Uh, but when you actually look into it, women play, um, the, ro the role that women play is uh, much more comprehensive than that. So there are examples of women um, taking part in, jih in jihad and including suicide bombings. For example, the Black Widows uh, in Chechnya. Um, there are also uh, women like studying religion and becoming sort of learned in religion. Um, they can play a role in like recruiting new members and raising funds and working as doctors and teachers. And um, the reasons why you know, women are actually <laughs> engaging in these roles is because uh, of this um, uh, sort of uh, gender ideology uh, propagating sort of um, segregation between the genders. So um, there is this idea that if uh, men and women um, mix, even if women dress uh, in the niqab or in a very conservative way, that temptation will arise. Uh, and if temptation will arise, there is potential for sort of moral chaos. So um, there is uh, uh, sort of this idea that, you know, the gender should be segregated as much as possible. And what does that entail in practice? In practice, that entails that, you know, if, if women are going to learn uh, about religion and go to Khalwa classes, they need to be taught by women. If girls are going to school, they need go uh, and be taught at a, a school where there are female teachers. If women are in need of a doctor, they need to go to a female doctor. So it's kind of this <laughs> creating a parallel universe for women. But that also entails that women can take leadership positions in these movements, uh, that they take on new roles in, in, in um, uh, they get access to education. Um, so, um, I guess in, in certain contexts of, um, of gender segregation, um, you know, it, it can be seen as empowering for the women, um, especially in contexts where women have been uh, sort of uh, marginalized. And um, I have been uh, doing fieldwork among Salafis in Sudan, not the violent Salafis, but the, the ones that are, um, are sort of uh, aiming at uh, Islamizing from below. Uh, through nonviolent means, uh, but specifically been studying Ansar al Sunnah and women's uh, role in these movements. Uh, and um, it is really fascinating to see how, you know, this, this idea of gender segregation has meant that women have uh, established their own branch uh, of the mosque that women have to take leadership positions within these branches, that women are teaching, uh, that women, you know, take on really like new roles and find these spaces as uh, sort of empowering. Um, well, from the outside, it looks like an ideology that really sort of uh, puts women down and domesticates them. So, um, um, trying to wrap up, um, <clears throat> It is important going forward to recon recognize that there is a spectrum of sort of women's role um, in this sort of uh, Islamic insurgency uh, in the context of Islamic insurgencies. And we know from the women and war literature that um, uh, the way that women are portrayed in, in, in war narrative, it matters of how or whether they are included in female uh, formal peace building efforts. So if in the Mozambican context, women are primarily viewed as like victims of violence, uh, um, you know, going forward, thinking about sort of de-radicalization and, and sort of peace building efforts, then it's very likely that they will only be recognized as a need of protection in those processes, not as agents of change or as targets of de-radicalization. 
So, um, yeah, maybe we should bring gender a little bit more into the, in the, into the conversation. And I say that without knowing the Mozambican context very well. Um, but at least to acknowledge that, you know, women can actually, you know, take part in these movements uh, and not suffer from sort of like a false consciousness or, I mean, going into it with open eyes. At the same time, uh, recognizing, you know, the extreme violence that uh, uh, these movements can uh, exert on women and also uh, acknowledge that women can play an important role in fighting um, uh, these uh, sort of um, uh, ideologies and, and violences. So thank you. Thank you, Liv. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's extremely enlightening to, to look and hear about these, uh, uh, as you say, the spectrum, and it is always important. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, we are very well beyond uh, our expected time. I don't know if anyone else uh, has uh, any question, either for Liv or, or the other attendees. Uh, if not, uh, I would like to thank everyone who was present here today um, and uh, for, your, um, for your participation and uh, your contributions, your contribution to the discussion and the, the critical engagements that we have had. Um, unfortunately, we're not solving the war here and we're not solving uh, uh, what is happening. Um, so, yes, uh, João, I think, has a question, but he has only written the... Yeah, name. he can be, well, I was, I was uh, wondering if I could uh, just send the question in private, because I was just uh, saying that this is a very interesting issue that... Uh, I'm very concerned and uh, I would like to read more about uh, uh, the participant. To, I mean, uh, read more about uh, studies uh, about uh, the participation of women in, um, in these kinds of conflicts. Maybe if Liv uh, uh, has published something about it or could recommend uh, something that I would appreciate but uh, it can be in private. Yes, of course, I, I'd be happy. I can send it to Carmelisa and she can send it to you. Yeah. If not, yes. uh, you need to give me your email. He's in the email. Right <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you. To, yeah, to anyone, anyone who is uh, hearing and participating, if this issue interests you further, if you have questions, we are, of course, uh, our emails are, uh, are available. You, you can search us at the Bergen Global, um, at, the, at the Bergen Global page. You have our affiliations. Maybe we haven't as, uh, answered uh, your concerns in, uh, as you have hoped. Uh, I see Sabina is here from last week as well. You had a particular concern related to uh, to the people who have returned from, um, from East Germany. I'm not sure if uh, João or Salvador have heard anything about the Magermans and, uh, and, and either their participation or their grievances in, the, in, 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 this, uh, in this conflict if it has bared and if it is part of the, some of the grievances that are present. No, I, I didn't heard anything about that. What I know is that uh, measurements in other uh, provinces, like for instance in Tet, uh, uh, normally, when there are some uh, groups of uh, Hanamo that formed uh, in some districts of Tet, uh, many times I, I found that there were one Majerman among this uh, Hanamo group, but it was not a guerrilla group, it was a, a, formal, a formal group. They are normally people uh, brave and with courageous to create uh, an opposition party 
um, in those in those areas where to being from the opposition is uh, an attitude of uh, of braveness, but in capital God, I didn't hear anything about that. Mm -hmm. Salvador. Um, oh, I have no information uh, about that with regard to Cabo Delgado. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yes, well, again, thank you everyone and for your contributions. There are, I think there is a, a, a lot to discuss and I hope that we can uh, uh, at a future point um, talk again, talk further, discuss some of the issues. There were very interesting points being put forward. Uh, and I thank uh, Antonio had to leave us uh, before, but leave and Antonio, I think you gave us a lot of uh, food for thought and things to think about um, for, for people who are on the ground and discussing and, and, and thinking about this issue. Thank you everyone.